Thank you, Paula, for another beautiful prelude. Last week, we began a sermon series based on James chapter 5, verse 16. And the last part of that verse reads, The effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Today, we want to begin laying a biblical foundation upon which we can all build an effective, energized, and powerful prayer life. But before we begin, I'd like to lead us in prayer, and then we'll hear Molly Sue Prowant singing, When He Was on the Cross, I Was on His Mind. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful love for us. Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for all that Jesus went through so that we could have a wonderful love relationship with you. And we pray that even today, you would allow your spirit to teach us, to speak to us through your word. And Lord, would you take our hearts and just turn them to you. Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for desiring for us to have a relationship with you. And we certainly thank you so much for Jesus, for all he did on our behalf. And even today, we just praise you in his wonderful name. Amen. I'm not on an ego trip I'm nothing on my own I've made mistakes and I often slip Just common flesh and bone But I'll prove Someday, just why I say I'm of a special kind. When he was on that cross, I was on his mind. on his face the thorns were on his head blood was on his scarlet robe stained a crimson red though the eyes were on the crown That was such a blessing. You know, everything about Christianity is relational. 
and prayer is the main communication element of the relationship that one has with God. Now in human relationships, we all know that if the communication levels are poor, the relationships are not going to be healthy or growing. But if communication between two people is strong, clear, authentic, and consistent, then there is a more than likely chance that the relationship is authentic and healthy. And this same reality is certainly true in our relationships with God. So let me ask you this question. How is your prayer life today? Now, I could almost just as easily have asked, so how is your relationship with God today? And if we were truly honest with ourselves, the answers would probably be very similar. Now, those two questions lead us into today's sermon, which is entitled, Righteousness Defined. You know, James knew when he wrote his epistle that sin between us and God can negatively affect both our relationships with Him as well as our communication with Him. Now, most people think that God hears everything that they pray, but the psalmist knew differently. In Psalm 66, 18, it reads, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So the bottom line is, when it comes to fruitful, energized praying, we need to be walking in victory over sin, and we need to be walking in righteousness. So what does the Bible say about righteousness? First of all, it says that God is perfectly righteous. In 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 6, it says, So the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is righteous. In Ezra chapter 9, verse 15, it says, O Lord, God of Israel, you are righteous, for we have been left an escaped remnant as it is this day. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for no one can stand before you because of this. And then in Psalm 11, verse 7, it says, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. And then Psalm 129, verse 4, The Lord is righteous. He has cut in two the cords of the wicked. And then in Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 5, The Lord is righteous within her, within Israel, and He will do no injustice. Every morning He brings His justice to light. He does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. God has established the standards of righteousness through His character and His actions, and He's communicated those standards to us through His Word. That's so important for us to understand. He's also given His children the Holy Spirit to teach us those standards and to guide us and to empower us to walk according to those standards. That's why it's so important for us to have the Word of God before us and to continually be reading the Word of God. And who perfectly modeled those standards of righteousness for us? Jesus did. Now, secondly, Jesus is seen in Scripture as perfectly righteous. In Isaiah 53, 11, it reads, By His knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as He will bear their iniquities. And then Pilate's wife referred to Jesus as righteous. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 19, it says, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, saying to Pilate, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night, I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. And then following Pentecost, in Peter's sermon, we see in Acts chapter 3, verse 14, but you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we see that God is perfectly righteous and Jesus is perfectly righteous. Well, thirdly, can human beings like you and me, can we actually be considered as righteous? Now, in order to come up with a biblical answer, we need to take a broad look at Scripture in answering that. And first of all, the Bible tells us that no one is righteous. And we often tend to think that way about ourselves, certainly. In Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, 
There's a quote from Psalm chapter 14 that reads, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. So how does this thought that there's no one who's righteous fit in when you look at the Bible and see that there are many people who are called righteous? You have to ask the question, did they never sin? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, it refers to Abel. It says, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. And then in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, you see Noah being described as a righteous man, blameless in his time. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, Lot was described as righteous. It says, and he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. And then at the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus, we see in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, that Zacharias and Elizabeth were both considered to be righteous. It says they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And so the scripture goes on then, naming a number of other people. Joseph, Mary's husband, was described as righteous. Simeon was described as righteous. John the Baptist, Joseph of Arimathea, and Cornelius were all individuals that the Bible describes as righteous. Now, these individuals even though described as righteous, we know that they all had sin in their life because the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how can this be? Where does righteousness in a human life come from? The answer is found in Romans 5 verses 18 through 19. And here's the answer. We are made righteous by the saving work and power of Jesus as we are united with him through salvation. That passage reads, So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through the one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, through Adam's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it reads, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then again in 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Now in closing, I want every believer and every member of White Bluff Chapel to understand that you can be a righteous intercessor. You can pray from a position of righteousness today, but it's only because of the one who is perfect in his righteousness living in you. Now, as we conclude today, I want us to leave with some practical thoughts. I want us to leave with a practical picture of what it means for us to have in our lives the righteousness of Christ so we can pray as righteous intercessors. If you would take your Bibles today and turn with me to Romans chapter 6, we want to look at what God says in verses 1 through 11 this morning about actually being able to, to walk in Jesus. So if you'd follow along as I read today from this passage. It says in Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. 
For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. I want us to pause right there if I could and just think about the verses we just read. Now the point that stands out from these first seven verses in Romans 6 is that we need to know that because we are in Christ, our old man who keeps wanting to sin has been buried with Jesus. So if you're a believer here today, your old man has been buried with Christ. And when we see ourselves buried with Christ, we need to recognize that our debt of sin has been completely paid for because of our union with Him. Now that covers not only our past sins, but it also covers any sins that we may commit in the future. All paid for as Jesus died in our place and was buried in the tomb. Now I want to illustrate that using this uh, rather unusual illustration. I have here in my hand a book this morning, and then I have a paper person. I want you to pretend that this paper person is actually you. Now, the Bible says that we are in Jesus. Now, in just the same way, I'm going to take you as a child of God, and I'm going to put you in this book. And I want you to pretend like this book is Jesus. Would you do that with me this morning? So... Here you are totally enclosed in the book, totally placed in and covered by Jesus. Now, when you believe in Jesus, the two of you become one to the extent that everything that was in his past is now your past. Everything that is his future is now going to become your future because you have become one with him. Now, where would the paper person be if I took this book out and buried it in the ground? You know, I really thought about that this morning. I went outside, and Valerie loves to keep the front of her house beautiful, and so she's planted all these beautiful flowers and has just a, a beautiful flower garden right there at the front of her house. I thought about actually going out and digging in her flower garden and burying this book. But then better judgment took over, men, and I decided just to describe it. So if we took this book and we actually went out and buried it in the ground, where would you be as you are inside this book? Well, you'd be buried in the ground. How about if I dug this book up and I put it in a, a nice package and I addressed it and sent it to Jerusalem? Where would you be? Well, you'd be the same place the book was. You would be in Jerusalem because you are in the book. Does that make sense? Because you have been placed inside this book, whatever happens to it is now your life, your testimony. And in just the same way, because we were placed in Jesus, the spiritual reality is that right now, according to Ephesians 2.6, you are positionally seated with Jesus in the heavenlies. And someday, we'll actually be there in Christ, exalting God and magnifying God and worshiping God. And so your position spiritually is one of righteousness because you have died with Jesus. You've been buried with Jesus. And everything about your old man has been placed in the tomb with Christ in order for us to realize that we can walk in righteousness and pray in righteousness, we've got to accept that as true. Now, the reality of accepting the fact that we are buried with Jesus is difficult for us. You know, in Scripture, there were two thieves that hung on crosses next to Jesus. And they died that day, the day that Jesus died. And we can accept that fact as true because we read it in the Bible. Well, it, is it any less true that, that you have died with Christ and you've been buried with Jesus? It's stated there in Scripture, the very same truth. Do you believe that? It's important for us to realize that just as 
We receive salvation by faith. We have to today believe by faith that we have died and our old man is in the tomb with Jesus. That's so important for us to exercise that faith daily and to accept it as true. Now, the second thing we need to see from, from Romans chapter 6 and verses 8 through 10 is that we not only have been buried with Christ, but we've been raised with Christ. And it says, now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. And so you and even you and I, as we are in Christ Jesus, we need to realize that we have been raised with Him. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And the life that we can live is now covered with the power of the resurrected Jesus so that we too can make decisions to not sin. We no longer have to be bound by sin. Now, the last verse that we want to look at in Romans 6 says this, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the third point is this. Every day, if we're going to be effective intercessors, we have to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God. We have to recognize that the righteousness of Jesus is present within us. Therefore, when we are tempted to sin or we fall into sin, right then we need to stop and we need to do some accounting. That word reckon in verse 11 is an accounting term. I'm not sure Tom could understand this and the other accountants in the church, where when you do accounting, you, you look at what the facts are on the page and you don't add to them, you don't take away from them. In accounting, you have to be perfectly exact. And the perfect truth about you is that you have been buried with Jesus, you've been raised with Jesus, and now Jesus, who's alive, lives in you. The resurrection of Christ is available to you. So, so we can walk in a resurrected type of way where we can choose not to sin, not because of our goodness, not because of our righteousness, but because of Christ's righteousness, because of His presence and His power within us. So here's the conclusion for today. I want to challenge you daily to reckon yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God through Christ Jesus. Now, you may say, well, was that just a mental exercise? No. It is an acceptance of the reality that Christ is alive in you. If you have never memorized Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I want to challenge you to do that this week. Uh, that verse needs to become a key life verse probably for all of us if we're going to be key intercessors. It says in Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered Himself up for me. It's important for us to claim that verse over our lives and to know that it's true. I have been crucified with Christ. I've died. My old man is dead. Nevertheless, I live. And it's not me, but it's Christ living in me. And the life that I now live, I'm living by faith. I'm putting all my faith in the fact that Jesus lives in me and He can enable me, empower me to live a righteous life. He can empower me to look at a sin when temptation comes my way and turn away from it. To be different, to be a new man, a new creation. In essence, to begin to look like Jesus. Now, does that mean I will never sin? Certainly not. But it means that as soon as I sin, there's the power within me to turn away from that sin, to not do it again. To actually see Jesus delivering us from the unrighteousness that's in this world and certainly connected to our flesh. 
You know, when I was a young man, I remember how it wasn't unusual for a cuss word to come out of my mouth. And I remember at times, even if I didn't say it, a cuss word would come into my head. But you know, by the power of God and by His righteousness, that never happens in my life anymore. And I don't even think that way anymore. In other words, through spending time with Jesus and depending on Him, He has completely taken that out of my life. He's completely removed it as, a, as one of my ways or one of my, my thoughts. And the power of God is able in any one of us, regardless of what sins we may struggle with, He's able to deliver us from those sins so we don't think it, we don't do it anymore. And it's not us, it's not our strength, it's not our righteousness, but it's the righteousness of Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Spirit enabling the truth of God and the ways of God to actually become our ways. So what James was saying in James 5, 16 was this, that if we want to have effective prayer as a part of our life and see things happen around us, it's very important for us to make the commitment to let Jesus be so alive in us that he keeps changing us, making us more and more like God, making the word come alive in us so that the reality of Jesus is seen in us. I trust that God will bless you this week. And I wanna challenge you again to memorize Galatians 2.20 and think of it often this week if you've not done that before. And even as we close today, I want us to pray again and just ask God to help every single one of us to just realize the truth that Jesus is in us and our righteousness today can come from Him. That changed life, that new life that Jesus promised us, that abundant life can be ours, not because of our strength, but because of the presence of Jesus within us. So I wanna lead us in prayer and then after I pray, our uh, White Glove Chapel mini choir will lead us in how deep the Father's love for us is. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and thank you for the truth that we can become righteous. Lord, not by our own effort. Lord, we realize that there is within our flesh no good thing. And no matter how good we may try to be, Lord, our effort always produces failure. But Lord, we look to you today because we acknowledge that what your word says is true and the righteousness of Jesus is what changes us. It's the righteousness of Jesus within us that empowers us to be able to see sin and turn away from it. And Lord, we realize that sin so hurts our relationship with you. It so hinders and hurts our prayer life, our communication. And I just pray that you would continue to change all of us, myself included, in a huge way, Lord, where my heart is so much like the heart of your son, Jesus, that our communication can be undisturbed. And Lord, I, I know in your presence no wickedness dwells. And I realize when I try to come before you and pray and I've got unconfessed, unrepentant sin in my life that even as your word said in, in Psalm 66, you choose not to even hear us. So Lord, would you do that work in our hearts today, continually pushing us to long for the righteousness of Jesus and to long to walk in such a close relationship with you that communication between the two of us is always good. Lord, would you keep working in our lives this week? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.